I'm Professor Adam Thompson, and in this discussion, we're going to talk about abdominal and GI emergencies. Uh, it's obviously one of the most common uh, types of emergencies you come across, uh, both pre-hospitally and in the emergency department setting. Uh, so it's important to have a pretty comprehensive understanding of the different array of emergencies that can present and the different treatments that they may require. So this lecture will span over several different videos, and in these videos, I'm going to discuss the following. A review of the anatomy and physiology of the GI system. That's pretty important to understand uh, what's going on with these patients. Assessment of the abdominal and GI emergencies. So, of course, we have to know how to assess these patients and come up with a differential diagnosis and a field diagnosis then to perform treatments. Uh, characteristics of the different pathologies, uh, because, again, it's going to help you with your differential. Uh, treatment of the abdominal GI patient. And then prevention techniques. So here's a few facts to kind of emphasize the importance of understanding abdominal GI emergencies. So GI disorders account for 246,000 deaths and 21.7 million hospitalizations per year. It's quite a lot. Uh, with the exception of sepsis, most GI disorders are generally not deadly. Uh, 25 to 40% of the population has GERD or esophageal uh, reflux disease. Sometimes you'll hear people say they have acid reflux, and that's what we're talking about there. And according to the National Institute of Health, 60 to 70 million people are affected by digestive diseases. So as I said before, it's important to understand the anatomy and the physiology of our GI system. And, you know, uh, we're going to have a quick review of that to help us better understand abdominal and GI emergencies. All right, so you may be familiar with the four quadrants of the abdomen. It's kind of an uh, easy way for us, you know, in healthcare to differentiate where the patient's symptoms are. So if we were to say they have right upper quadrant pain or left lower quadrant pain, do you know what that means? And quite simply, you're going to separate the abdomen by finding the umbilicus right in the middle, uh, the belly button, and then you just draw a straight line intersecting at that umbilicus, both superior and inferiorly, and then uh, laterally. Okay, so... By drawing that T, so to speak, you can create the, the four quadrants of the abdomen. And then over here, you could see, in this image on the, on the right here, if you were to separate the four quadrants, you could see which organs are in which quadrants. So obviously, the liver is mostly in the right upper quadrant here, right? A little bit of the liver in goes into the left upper quadrant, but we're mostly talking about the right upper quadrant. And inside that liver... Uh, you know, tucked underneath it is the gallbladder. Uh, it's tucked under there in the right upper quadrant. So quite often, somebody with cholecystitis or inflammation of the gallbladder due to, uh, you know, gallstones will experience right upper quadrant pain. Um, your spleen is over here in the left upper quadrant. Um, and your appendix is down here in the right lower quadrant. And that's very specific for appendicitis, for them to have right lower quadrant pain. All right. So that's, imp that's why it's important to know these different locations. And now we're going to talk about the physiology, all right, of the GI system. And digestion, okay, it begins in the mouth. The molars in your mouth will crush and grind uh, the food, allowing it to be more easily swallowed. This changes the consistency of the food. Uh, that it prevents aspiration. Enzymes in the saliva will then begin to chemically break down the complex carbohydrates into simple sugars for easier absorption of the body. So in your mouth, your teeth, you know, uh, the saliva in your mouth are actually aiding in the di digestion of food at very early stages of you know, your, your digestion. Then as food is swallowed, it is moved down to the esophagus, which is a hollow tube. Uh, unless it is filled with food, the esophagus generally lies in a collapsed position. Um, and then as it fills, you know, it starts to open up, allowing food in. During bag mask ventilation, air can be pushed into the esophagus as well as the lungs. And this causes gastric distension. So this is a one indication of getting an advanced airway. If you've got prolonged uh, ventilation, you know, in a patient, uh, you may be getting that uh, gastric insufflation, which you don't want because that could cause distension and and it will cause an increase in gastric pressure, intrathoracic pressure, decrease in cardiac output. So none of, the, none of that's good, right? Um, so eventually you, that person might require an advanced airway. Um, but back to digestion. So as food is in the esophagus, you're going to use something called peristalsis. Peristalsis is kind of that rhythmic moving 
all right, of the smooth muscle to get food moved inferiorly towards the stomach. Once food is in the stomach, hydrochloric acid is secreted to break down the food. You may have heard of stomach acid before, right? That's probably the lowest pH in your body is your stomach acid. And uh, that's why if somebody vomits a lot, you know, they can actually become more alkaline uh, and, and by losing all that acid. And that's not necessarily a good state either. So keep that in mind. So that hydrochloric acid is, is breaking down food in the stomach. And the stomach contracts and mixes the food and acid together, kind of churning around in there, right? And then substances that are uh, of small molecular size are absorbed, such as water, alcohol, caffeine, uh, and some of the medications that we take, uh, you know, uh, by mouth, they will be absorbed straight into your bloodstream right there. Uh, chyme, which is food mixture, exits the pyloric sphincter and enters the duodenum, all right? So down here, we have this sphincter. So you, ha you have your esophageal sphincter um, that also can, can limit food from coming into the stomach. And then you have your pyloric sphincter. All right. Um, and that, that food, will, that chyme, will move past that into the duodenum. And then here is where the pancreas, the liver, and the gallbladder will connect to the digestive system following this. So it's important to remember that the main function of the GI system is to absorb the digested food, uh, which adds fuel to the body's cells. 90% of this absorption occurs in the small intestine. The pancreas secretes enzymes into the duodenum to assist with uh, the digestion of fats, proteins, and carbohydrates, and it neutralizes gastric acid. So, you know, in, the, in this picture here is a picture of the pancreas, and, and in the middle of it you could see you have your pancreatic duct here, and that can get clogged and, and inflamed, and that's where we get pancreatitis, all right, um, is, is this pancreas. You see the gallbladder here is kind of connected via the cystic duct, right? Um, so sometimes these gallstones can make it into that pancreatic duct, and, and that can clog and, and cause the uh, pancreatitis that we talked about. Sometimes those gallstones that are created in the gallbladder, they can uh, clog right here and cause uh, cholecystitis. Um, so... Uh, that's the cause of those things. You could see here's where the spleen sits. And remember, the pancreas kind of sits right here inside the duodenum, all right, uh, right before the small intestine starts. All right, next up, we have a very important organ, the liver. The liver produces bile, and then the bile is stored in the gallbladder. So think of the gallbladder just as like this bank full of, you know, uh, bile deposits that are used to break down fats whenever you eat, you know, fatty foods. Um, so it's not a required organ, you know, it's like an accessory organ, so to speak. So when you get cholecystitis, you could actually have removal of the gallbladder via cholecystectomy, um, and you'd still be able to eat fatty foods. Uh, your body would just produce the bile on demand from the, from the liver, uh, and you may need to take a probiotic or something like that because it could be, uh, you could have uh, secondary problems digesting, uh, you know, if you ate a lot of fatty foods. Um, however, most people, after they have their gallbladder removed, don't have too many issues. Um, the liver also promotes carbohydrate metabolism. And if your blood glucose level falls, the liver can actually convert glycogen into glucose, which is sugar, right? Um, so if, if you weren't getting enough blood sugar, uh, your liver will take over and convert glycogen into glucose, which is a pretty cool process. It also detox detoxifies some drugs and... Uh, it completes the breakdown of dead blood cells, all right? The liver does a lot of filtering, and it stores vitamins and minerals. It's a very important organ, uh, and the portal vein transport venous blood uh, from the GI tract to the liver. So the portal vein is, uh, you know, a very important vein that will transport blood from the GI tract to the liver. For a variety of reasons, blood flow through the liver can be slow, the veins uh, surrounding the stomach and the esophagus can become dilated if blood backs up. Uh, this creates varices, you know. A small amount of pressure can cause leaking or rupture of these vessels. Uh, you may have heard of esophageal varices, but that can also happen in the stomach lining or the, the blood vessels surrounding the stomach, rather. Um, not a great thing. And then uh, this bleeding could be minor or severe. Uh, you, you may have heard of esophageal varices that rupture in the patient. just has constant... Uh, blood coming out of their mouth, including their airway. It's a difficult intubation. 
um, and they could become hypovolemic, of course, on top of the fact that they have airway compromise. So it could be a pretty uh, serious condition. So after, you know, food makes it past uh, the stomach and the duodenum where it gets uh, enzymes from the liver, gallbladder, pancreas, uh, it, it moves to the small intestine, it, you know, through peristalsis moves all around the small intestine until it finally reaches the large intestine, also known as the colon. Uh, and the colon moves the remaining waste products to be eliminated from the body. The main role of the large intestine is to complete the reabsorption of water because you don't want to eliminate all water. And it helps to uh, solidify the stool and make it a little bit more solid. Uh, failure of the bowel function results in soft stool or diarrhea. So if, you're, if your large intestine isn't doing a good job of uh, reabsorbing water, you could have you know diarrhea. The colon is the site of bacterial digestion. Uh, bacteria help the breakdown of chyme, uh, and gas or flatulence is a byproduct of that breakdown. And don't think of bacteria as always being a bad thing. We always think of bacteria as infection, but there's good gut biome that you have to maintain, and that bacteria, that, that, that flora within your stomach lining and your intestines is an important aspect of digestion. And then the appendix is actually a small sac-like outcropping of the colon, um, and it has no known function. It may have had a function at some point uh, when we used to eat a lot more raw meats or something like that, but currently uh, it, it doesn't really do much, and it can become it, infected with uh, retained fecal matter. You know, bacteria can build up in any kind of sac-like structure, but especially that appendix, and uh, cause an inflammation. This can become enlarged, cause severe right lower quadrant pain. Uh, often the patient will have severe nausea, vomiting, and, and, and a fever from the inflammation process. And it, it could, if it ruptures, it could cause some serious risk for infection and, and sepsis. So it's a pretty common procedure to get an appendectomy and get the appendix removed. And of course, you can live uh, perfectly fine without it. A couple structures to keep in mind is your your colon is generally separated into three parts. Your ascending colon, the transverse colon, and the descending colon. And of course, you do have your rectum here at the end. And then uh, you have the splenic flexure, which is on your left side, and your hepatic flexure, which is on your right side. And that's easy to remember because the liver is more on your right, and the spleen is more on your left. And that's why they're named that way. Because if you look at this big picture, you could see that the hepatic flexure sits right under the liver there, and the splenic flexure sits right under the spleen. So it makes sense. And with that, we're going to conclude this first video uh, on abdominal and GI emergencies. We've reviewed the entire anatomy and physiology of the GI system. However, it's not too comprehensive of a review. Um, you get the main point of view that digestion begins in the mouth, with chewing and saliva breaking down, you know, complex carbohydrates. Then peristalsis brings food down the esophagus, past your esophageal sphincter into your stomach. And in your stomach, you have some uh, acid, that stomach acid that helps break down foods. And the, it kind of, the food kind of churns around. It becomes chyme. Uh, it goes through that pyloric sphincter into the duodenum. And in the duodenum, it, it receive, receives some enzymes, maybe some from the pancreas, gallbladder, liver, uh, helps break down foods even further, um, and then enters into the small intestine, eventually the colon or the large intestine, where it can be excreted. And that's kind of the, uh, the journey that food takes in the process of digestion.